Welcome. Welcome Rotarians and guests to the Rotary Club of Seattle, the fourth oldest and one of the world's largest Rotary Clubs, where we embrace service above self, connecting for good. I'm Kathy Gibson, and I'm your club president this year, and I am delighted to welcome you today to the first of a series of this year's many business programs where we are going to be fo uh, featuring and focusing on innovative leaders and industries. Today we have a program that celebrates an emerging business sector in our region, the commercial space industry. We'll shine our spotlight on Blue Origin, one of the prominent players in this sector. We'll have an opportunity to marvel at the innovation, partnership, and accomplishments that are happening right here in our midst. But to begin our program, it's my pleasure to welcome past president Dorothy Bullitt to offer our inspiration for the day. And then please remain standing for today's song. Lou Lundquist will be leading it, and Freeman Fong will be accompanying him on the piano. Dorothy? Thank you, Kathy. This has been a rough summer. We're emotionally exhausted by conflict, violence, and the raging headlines. But Rotary helps. It reminds us of humanity's potential for decency and for progress. Let us find solace in this beautiful city and the summer light. Let us find solace in community and friendship. Let us find solace in what we can do for others. Let us find solace in glimpsing the common ground we share with those whose skin is a different color, who may pray to a different God, who will vote for a different candidate. Let's remember how much we actually share as fellow human beings. Let's muster some hope and reflect on the poem by Shina Pugh. Sometimes things don't go, after all, from bad to worse. Some years, Muscadel faces down frost. Green thrives, the crops don't fail. Sometimes a man aims high and all goes well. A people sometimes will step back from war, elect an honest man, decide they care enough that they can't leave some stranger poor. Some men become what they were born for. Sometimes our best efforts do not go amiss. Sometimes we do as we meant to. The sun will sometimes melt a field of sorrow that seemed hard frozen. May it happen to you. May it happen for all of us. One of our region's treasures is the Museum of Flight. At the helm of this great institution for over five years is Doug King. Doug, you want to come and join me up here for a minute? More than a minute? Doug is a Bay, uh, Bay Area native and a Stanford undergrad. He actually completed his MBA at the University of Washington, so we've got a Husky in our midst. Doug came to the Museum of Flight from the St. Louis Science Center, the fourth largest science center in the nation, where he had been their president and CEO for over 15 years. Doug also did time in the other Washington as president of the Challenger Center for Space Science Education. Fascinated by space and aviation, Doug has turned the Museum of Flight into the ultimate locale for convening brilliant and innovative minds. And this was exemplified just last month when we hosted the new space conference, hosted in Seattle actually for the very first time. Given the chance, Doug would go into space in a heartbeat. Is that true? Okay and is actually one of the few leaders <laughs> in the Puget Sound area, perhaps other than our current our other speaker today, Rob, who was consistently asked by former Risebeck Aviation High School students and museum program alumni who are interested in becoming astronauts to actually be a reference for them on their astronaut job applications. Nothing makes Doug prouder than watching young people, and hopefully one day your grandson, pursue all things space. So please give a warm Seattle Four Rotary welcome to Doug King. Wow, thank you so much. What, a, what an introduction. Um, I have a challenge for all of you. Does anybody know why today is special, July 20th? Does anybody remember what they were doing on July 20th, 47 years ago today? Now, I don't want you to reveal your age, 
but anybody who's in the room who's old enough will know exactly where they were when a human being uttered the words, that's one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. It's hard to believe that it was 47 years ago, and it's sort of equally hard to believe that most people won't think of that today. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how we got where we got since that incredible moment, and maybe more importantly, where we're going. Uh, I, I have to go back before I talk about the space story to talk about something else that happened this week. Um, this was the centennial of the Boeing Corporation. Do we have any Boeing folks here with us today? Well, it was a, a congratul well, John Warner, of course. Hi, John. <laughs> any Boeing folks in the room? Uh, congratulations to it, all of you who work with the company and everybody at Boeing. It's, it's what an achievement to get to 100 years, but it's not just that the company survived for 100 years, it's that it changed the world in 100 years. Uh, we celebrated at the museum this weekend with, with Boeing employees and retirees and their families, and it really struck me that this isn't a story of airplanes, it's a story of people. It's a story of folks who were born before there were cars, when a trip from the East Coast to the West Coast was permanent, who settled Seattle, who cut timber, who did all, built ships and, and explored, explored for resources and the things that were going on in the community th back then, but then had the vision to say, gosh, I, I hear there's a, a new thing called an airplane. I wonder how that could be used. And so Bill Boeing wasn't an airplane designer. He was a guy who thought they were pretty cool. And to, to, um, June of, two, excuse me, June of 1916, imagine what it was like when he took off from Lake Union in the f very first Boeing airplane, the B&W that he built with a friend of his. Uh, people had just heard that this was something that happened elsewhere around the world. And, and it was probably a quiet morning and a little bit of work going on on boats around the lake. And if you were out walking or, um, you, you heard a strange sound and looked over at the lake and saw a very strange looking boat start to move across the water and go faster and faster and lift off. Can you imagine what that looked like the first time somebody saw it? And 20 years later, people were flying from here to Chicago on scheduled airlines. It's really an in incredible achievement. Um, it goes back even much farther. You know, for thousands of years, people dreamed of flying. You can find drawings on cave walls and the stories of Icarus and Da Vinci and so on. But it really is only a blink of history, only 113 years now since the Wright brothers flew at Kitty Hawk. And in that time, airplanes have changed the world. Where we live, where our kids are, where we take vacations, how we work, how countries interact with each other, we expect now from that first flight to be able to go out to the airport and go just about anywhere we want to go in the world, just about whenever we want to go, and we're very upset if our luggage isn't there when we get there. Um, it's amazing that 25,000 flights take off every day now, and if one doesn't get where it's going, it's international news. That's just a, an astounding technological and human achievement. So think about, that's, that's only 100 years, think about looking forward. I mean. My grandson that Kathy mentioned, uh, my daughter thinks it's very funny to point out to, to me that he'll be my age in 2075. Uh, not that funny. <laughs> but think of the world that he'll live in. And you think he's going to be satisfied to still fly 600 miles an hour and take six hours to get to New York? This is going to seem ancient to him, the way the breakthroughs that the Boeing company overcame seem to us. Um, in fact, go even farther into the future. Think for a minute about what historians will write about our times a thousand years from now. You can try this, it's fun, at a, at a dinner party uh, or with people at work or um, at Thanksgiving dinner, which is where I first heard it from a nephew of mine who came back from college and we, a, a teacher was trying to get them focused on, on what of all the news that we're hearing and the things that we're spending our time thinking about every day are really important. What will historians write about our time a thousand years from now? In fact, what do, we th what do we know about the year 1016? You know, what will people in 3016 know about us? And I won't make you go through the exercise, but it's fun to let people talk about this for a while, and they will come up with the fact that it's probably not gonna be who wins this presidential election, or who wins the Super Bowl, or what the latest song is, or whether they captured the Pokemon guy today. <laughs> it, it's gonna be big issues. It's gonna be like, um, 
uh, the, the radical change in the in environment over this time and, and our understanding of human interaction with the environment. How did that turn out? The unleashing of the atomic, uh, uh, of atomic power. Where did that go? The it, human interaction with climate, the incredible change in lifespans over the last 100 years, increased lifespans by 40 years. Will that continue? Or the incredible increase in population from 2 billion to 7 billion? How did that turn out? So 1,000 years from now, they'll be looking back at, I even had somebody say when we tried this at work, it, this will be known as the era of the grocery store, the first time in human history when most people, at least in, in the developed countries, don't have to think most of the time about where their next meal is coming from. And so what will people say 1,000 years from now is wide open to your speculation. But it's interesting that every time I've ever had that exercise, the number one answer is 1,000 years from now, people will say this was the era when humans first left the earth. First into the atmosphere and then beyond. First in a little tiny biplane at Kitty Hawk and then off Lake Union and now all over the world anytime we want to go and oh yes, they went to the moon. They explored all the planets and is there any reason to think that we're going to stop there? So that's really the story of, of today and this 47th anniversary of the moon landing it's fascinating to look back at how that happened. Um, a fellow named Werner von Braun went to, the, to uh, everybody he could think of in the, mid, in the mid 50s. You know, he built rockets for the Germans during the war. He came to the United States. He headed our program and he put together a team of people and went out and tried to convince folks that we could go to space. He convinced Walt Disney and those of you that are old enough will remember Disneyland on Sunday nights when we had about three TV channels and we all sat and watched the same thing. On three consecutive Sunday nights in the mid-50s, he outlined his vision for going to the moon. And in the early 1960s, when we were very worried about what the Russians might do and the fact that they had sent the first satellite to space and the first human to space, President Kennedy looked to Werner von Braun and said, take us to the moon. Eight years later, we were there. Eight years, an incredible achievement. A bunch of young people, people in their 20s and 30s uh, who didn't understand that they couldn't do it and they went and did it. And in the wake of that landing, in August of 1969, Von Braun took his t and his team had sat down and gotten ready for that moment. They went back to the White House and told the president how we could go beyond. There's a great book called After Apollo, written by a fellow named John Logsdon, that tells about a presentation at the White House in the summer of 1969 by the same team that had just landed people on the moon to say, if you'll leave the budget where it is with the things that we've already designed, we'll build a space station in Earth orbit. We'll build a space station around the moon. We'll have a, basically a, a regular uh, transportation system back and forth between the Earth and the moon, and we'll go on to Mars and we'll land in 1984. The president was thinking about other things by then. His predecessor, uh, John Kennedy, got all the credit for the moon landing. He was thinking about the Vietnam War and a lot of other stuff, and he didn't buy that story, and so it just kind of faded away. And people ask me all the time, why haven't we gone back? What are we doing? What's NASA all about? Why, why aren't we still doing those great things? Well, they are doing great things. They're, they've explored all the planets. We will know in this generation whether there's any life in our solar system other than us. Um, incredible achievements, but the public hasn't thought it was important enough to continue space travel and exploration. You'll notice in this campaign and in the last camp couple of campaigns, it hasn't even come up as an issue. The public will to go beat the Russians or explore onto Mars and beyond isn't there. So a challenge to all of you to think about what our priorities were and to give NASA credit for what it's done on a greatly reduced budget and it has a plan. Um, they're building something called Space Launch System, which is about the size of the original Saturn rockets and will take us to Mars by the, about the mid-2030s. And so um, it, it's still out there. But here in Seattle, we're not going to wait that long. You know, the, the uh, entrepreneurs that have changed the world in a very different way in the last 45, 50 years um, are just going to do it on their own. I worked in Silicon Valley in the late 1970s, and there were people there who said, what do you think of this thing called a personal computer? People at IBM and Hewlett Packard said, why would you want one? <laughs> you know, what would, a computer was a big thing that 
lived in a room by itself and had people that guarded it that you handed punched cards to and was making insurance companies and, and uh, banks and university research and so on much easier. But why would I want a computer? But people like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates changed the world. Well, I think we're at that moment again. We're at a tipping point where entrepreneurs here in the Seattle community and a few places elsewhere around the world are saying, we're not going to wait for the public, we're not gonna wait for NASA because we see, see things that can be done in space. And I'll tell you, this, uh, this is the thing that excites young people when we talk to them about the future at the Museum of Flight. We have a broad array of educational programs that I'm glad to talk about any time, but the, the, um, the crux is that those human stories of the last century need to continue. We need to have young people who are excited, interested, and ready to write the next chapters of the story. And all you have to do is point out to them the opportunities. I had a friend that ran education at NASA who used to say there are two things that will always interest kids in the future. One is space and the other is dinosaurs. <laughs> if we ever get dinosaurs in space, we really got them made. <laughs> so you know, who knows? <laughs> We're discovering other planets around other stars all the time and we may in our lifetime discover life on one of them and who knows, it might be dinosaurs. But a little closer to home, we have people that aren't gonna wait for 2035, and they're saying, we're gonna go. How, how can they do this? Well, you're gonna hear the full story, but the, the simple version is it's still really expensive. The, there is a lot of business going on in space. Um, uh, there's an interesting article called A Day Without Space. How would your life be different without space? Well, first of all, none of our phones would work. Our GPS wouldn't work. The air traffic control system, the entire communication system of the world wouldn't work without satellites in geosynchronous orbit 24,000 miles above the Earth that are up there sending every one of our transactions back and forth, yes, even when we look for the Pokemon. And so other people are saying, well, maybe there's other business opportunities up there that'll support it, but it's, it's got to get cheaper to go. It can't be incredibly expensive. And, and we still throw away most of the vehicle other than the payload. It still lands in the ocean and um, you know, almost like flying a 747 from here to New York and then burning it before we fly back. And so they're working on how can we lower the cost. Um, we've all seen uh, science fiction stories where a rocket lands back on the pad until last year when our, our speaker today did that. He's now done it four times with the same rocket. We're learning how to make it reusable, learning how to get there cheaper and provide the opportunities for you not to think about how do I get there, what business can I do when I'm there? What research can I do? What engineering? What resource development? Um, all those things that may be scarce on Earth are out there in the asteroids and beyond. And maybe in fact, people. You know, I heard an estimate the other day that 100 years from now there'll be a million people living in space. That's not, there are only 500 people that have been so far it's time for a change. And so that's our story today. And, and I think the most exciting part of it is that it's happening right here in Seattle. Uh, this isn't some remote thing happening in Huntsville, Alabama or a Kennedy Space Center. This is a Seattle story. There are entrepreneurs here that, that always question what can we do differently? And you know them as well as I do. One of them, Jeff Bezos said, I think it's time to go. Founded a company called Blue Origin. And Blue Origin and the other Seattle companies are making this a new Silicon Valley of space. Kathy mentioned we hosted the New Space Conference. Um, we're getting an awful lot of attention. Companies are putting engineering um, facilities here because of the incredible capability. And so, yes, Seattle and the aerospace industry here has changed the world in the last hundred years. You haven't seen anything yet. Our speaker is Rob Meyerson, who worked for NASA, was a great part of that uh, classic development of some incredible space hardware and, um, and approaches to how you do things. He went to work for the first company that had the idea that maybe we could commercialize this, Kistler Aerospace. And they may have been a little bit ahead of the market, but showed everybody, you know, there are applications for this and came pretty darn close to, to making it happen themselves. And so he wasn't deterred at all. When Jeff Bezos said, let's do this, he came aboard and has been the president of Blue Origin since it started. I'll let him tell the story of the incredible things that they've accomplished. Rob Meyerson. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Doug. 
appreciate that, uh, that introduction, and, and uh, it's an honor to serve you on your board and uh, be a member of the Museum of Flight, and it's also an honor to be here today. Thank you, Kathy, uh, for, for the invitation and opportunity to be here. Um, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about a rocket that we launched and, and, and then kind of connect the dots for you uh, to where we're going in the future. Um, so just last year, a rocket that was built you know, right here in this area in Kent, Washington, uh, made history when we uh, flew it up to space uh, and then brought it back down vertically and landed it on a pad. And um, I want to start my talk with a video that shows you what that mission was like. Um, and then in the middle of that video, there's an animated sequence in the, in, in the, in the center of that, that that will show you what our future customers are going to experience when we start to offer tickets. Um, so let's take a look. Check good. Ready for flight. T minus 10 seconds. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four. Command engine start. Two, one. Ignition and liftoff. Max Q. Main engine cut out. CC detects separation. PM confirms separation. feet. Drag brake deploy. Estimate 10 seconds until engine restart. 12,000 feet. 5,000 feet. Engine starting. We have thrust. 1,000 feet. LGS deploy. 50 feet. 7 feet per second. Touchdown. Engine stop. Thank you. Uh, so when Doug talks about, you know, Jeff Bezos saying, let's do it, this is what we're talking about. This, this is what we, what we came on board to do. Uh, but it's just the beginning. And I want to talk about this flight, because it was really a beautiful flight. And the rocket landing was the, the thing that just created the, the euphoria in the room. We had to sort of wait and remember that we had a parachute, a capsule coming down under parachutes during that flight. Um, what we're doing there is we're solving the inverted pendulum problem. So, so balancing a rocket on its engine, you know, its rocket engine plume is like balancing a pencil on your fingertip. It's really a, a difficult thing to do. I encourage you to try it. Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe listen to me for a little bit more and then, and then try it later. But, uh, uh, but then once you've done that, now you've got to balance all these forces and then you've got to 
touch down on the center of that landing pad. It's a 130-foot diameter landing pad. You're coming from 60 miles up. And, um, and so we really thought that was an incredible feat. Um, pretty proud of the accomplishment. And uh, since that, that um, flight, we've reused that vehicle, as Doug mentioned, uh, three more times after that. So uh, first company to fly a rocket up to space and bring it back vertically, but then also the first company to go reuse it. And, uh, and what we're really doing is we're learning. And, and I'll talk more about why that's important. Uh, but more importantly, I can't wait to fly it again, and we're going to be doing that 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 soon. So, uh, um, my uh, my journey to Blue Origin started uh, uh, a number of years ago, and uh, I spent the first decade of my career working in Houston at NASA's Johnson Space Center. Um, I got my master's at University of Houston, so I'm a cougar, the other kind of cougar. But uh, um, <laughs> but uh, happy to be in Washington State. I've been here for for 19 years now. Um, and um, I worked on the space shuttle in Houston, and that was an incredible machine, and it was. Um, really a great opportunity to work with some incredibly smart and incredibly passionate people who are, were on the cusp of reusability and they're reusing the spacecraft part of it. What we're trying to do on Blue Origin is reuse a little bit more of it. Um, I brought that experience with me here to Seattle uh, to work at Kistler Aerospace and, uh, in 1997. And Kistler was on the cusp of that first uh, wave of new space, um, uh, developing a fully reusable uh, space launch vehicle. And, um, and what they were trying to do was uh, provide lower cost launch services to, uh, to meet the needs of this growing satellite launch market. There are companies like Iridium, uh, a company like Teledesic uh, here in Kirkland, who many of you may remember, it was started by Craig McCaw. Um, the uh, uh, Global Star, there's many other satellite constellations. Kistler was started to serve that market. That market sort of dropped away in the late 90s. We had to pivot and, and look for some other customers. Of course, NASA was a, was a good customer, but, but, but Kistler could not make it. But uh, my point is that, that, that beginning, uh, the be beginning of, new, of new space were really centered right here in Seattle um, with Kistler, and uh, it, was a, it was a really big, a big deal. And um, when Jeff Bezos founded Blue Origin, um, uh, this mission, the one I showed you in the video, landing a rocket back from space, was really envisioned, always envisioned as that first step, that one step in a long, long journey uh, to seed and endure during human presence in space. And Jeff views this future where there's millions of people living and working in space. And this is the first step. So um, in that view, you know, we showed that in the animated sequence in the video. Uh, we now have real camera views of what our customers are going to really, really see. Not that animated view, the real view. Um, looking out the window, um, we think it's going to be spectacular and it's going to be a great experience and like the video showed, it's about a four minute experience, um, but we really think it's going to be an opportunity to really, really taste what, what space is like um, for, for our customers and leading to the next steps, which is uh, living and working in space. So, so Apollo um, was a key turning point for our species. Um, extending beyond our planet was the first opportunity for humankind to go, go to another planet. And at Blue Origin, we, we imagine this future where, where millions of us are living, living beyond, you know, out there. And not just astronauts like Neil and Buzz and Michael Collins, but, but people like you and me. People sitting in this room uh, will have the opportunity to fly into space someday. Won't require Doug writing a letter of recommendation for them for their astronaut application. Um, it will require uh, buying, a ticking, have, uh, buying a ticket, having a reason to go, um, whether you're working there or, or living out there. Um, and so someday, you know, the name Blue Origin comes from that, that someday where, where we are living out there and we can look back on Earth, this blue planet, and look out on it as our Blue Origin. So, so you'll never forget the name now, um, I hope. <laughs> um, so um, our mission over the last year has really been focused on demonstrating that, that reusability works. And it's never been demonstrated before in the rocketry world. It's demonstrated every day in the aviation world. But in the rocketry world, it's, it's relatively new, and the, the loads are different. The, the environments that a rocket has to see are significantly different. Uh, and that's why it hasn't been done before. So um, what's been done? Rockets are thrown in the ocean. And um, the, a rocket lifts off, and its first and its second stages go off, and they, they go down to the ocean, and they're never, they're never seen before. So the um, rockets that carried our early space pioneers, like Alan Shepard and John Glenn, and then uh, Neil and Buzz and Michael Collins into, into space. Those rockets all ended up at the bottom of the ocean and, and uh, proud to say that you know, my boss, Jeff Bezos, went off on an exploration to go find some of those rocket engines that lifted those astronauts into space and parts of those are now on display in Doug's museum. And uh, we're, uh, uh, I think it's uh, pretty cool that uh, we get to go back and look at those things. Um, so 
the shuttle was originally visioned as a fully reusable system, um, but of course, um, as, the, as those budgets evolved and as the president's sort of administrations had other things to focus on, the, the, the original vision of the shuttle had to get scaled back, and they did something that was spectacular, but it was partially reusable. The orbiter piece, the winged vehicle, was reusable, and the other pieces were, were mostly expendable. Um, so you, if you imagine taking that same approach uh, with air travel, um, you can see how prohibitively expensive that would be. Boeing wouldn't be the company it's, it is today. People wouldn't get on airplanes for, for business or pleasure because it would just be too expensive. Uh, it, would be a, you know, it would be something that, that only, the, only the rich are afforded. Um, and so reusability really is at the heart of changing the way rocketry is viewed, and that's why we're so focused on this. That is our, that is our sole purpose in life, this is to lower the cost of space flight through demonstrating reusability. Um, and so New Shepard is this vehicle I showed, showed the video of. It's uh, designed to carry people, six people beyond 100 kilometers, which is the internationally recognized uh, line of space. Um, it is uh, the boundary of space. And once there, they'll experience um, weightlessness, about four minutes. Um, and then they'll have these great views out the window. And these windows are the largest windows that have ever been designed to fly into space. And we use, um, in our design process, we use advanced technologies like additive manufacturing, 3D printing, basically, um, uh, system optimization, computational fluid dynamics, um, and friction stir welding is another one of the technologies we use at Blue Origin. And we're using all these things uh, in New Shepard. Uh, it's engineered, it's designed, um, manufactured, assembled, and tested in our Kent facility with a local team that's rich in, rich in expertise in those areas. And they're motivated to come in and make a difference. Um, here's the, uh, the engine that powers uh, New Shepard. This is a liquid hydrogen engine um, that, that uh, develops, uh, it's called, we call it the BE3. And it uses liquid hydrogen as its fuel. As its fuel, liquid hydrogen is a liquid at minus 423 degrees Fahrenheit, so um, it's very, very cold. Uh, but it, uh, um, uh, this engine produces 110,000 pounds of thrust uh, at its top end. So as that rocket's lifting up, up the pad, we're throttling up to 110,000 pounds of thrust. And the real innovation is its ability to throttle all the way back down um, and, and uh, down to 20,000 pounds of thrust, which basically at the end of the mission, <laughs> That supports the ability of that rocket to stabilize and come down and land the empty stage, which is much lighter as you, after you've burned all your fuel. Uh, most rockets don't do that. Uh, one, one rocket system that did do that was back in 1969 was the lunar lander. Um, that lunar lander didn't generate 110,000 pounds of thrust, but it did have a, an ability to throttle way back, which allowed those uh, uh, astronauts to land on the moon um, and then take off and fly again back up to the the command module to meet Mike Collins and go back to Earth. So um, um, we, uh, I, I, I couldn't be more proud to be part of a team that's advancing propulsion technology and space technology uh, here, in, here in Kent, Washington. So our, uh, our endeavor has deep roots in this region. Um, we were established more than 15 years ago, uh, and in 2006, um, we moved from our location out near the West Seattle Bridge down in Georgetown. Uh, down to the Kent Valley into a facility that was um, being used by Boeing. Um, prior to that, it was where the Robbins Company had their headquarters. Uh, some of you may remember them, the Tunnel Boring Machine Company. Um, we now have more than 700 employees on staff. Uh, when I joined, it was about 10 people. So uh, um, that's been pretty cool to watch, watch the growth. Um, and uh, our employees have come from all corners of the country. Um, some of them have many years of experience. About a third of our staff have more than 20 years of experience. Uh, many of them are coming straight out of school, and uh, they're coming from our flagship universities, Washington State and University of Washington. They're also coming from some of the uh, other uh, schools around the country, like Purdue, like uh, MIT in Michigan, uh, Berkeley, uh, Colorado, and uh, Texas A&M University. Um, and, the, and as you can imagine, the economic impact of a business like this is significant. Um, our payroll alone is more than $50 million a year. Uh, but then the secondary benefits, all the services and supplies and things that we, we buy to run the business are, are a factor on top of that. Um, and we're really, really proud to call Washington State home. This is, a, this is just a wonderful place to live. Uh, uh, our employees, uh, they love it. Um, as Doug mentioned, you know, this region isn't new to trailblazers. And uh, um, we've had a long history of aerospace in here. And the, with the centennial of Boeing, I got the chance to go to the museum on Sunday night and see uh, and, and, and celebrate with the, with the members of the Boeing Company. It was just really fun to see all that history and, and uh, 
not just in space, but I mean, obviously the aviation part of it, which is really what, what Boeing started on. Um, you might think of Boeing as Seattle's first tech startup. Um, it, uh, it's been around for a long time, but the, uh, really there's a great idea that Bill Boeing had and he, and he um, went after it and, and just did it and went off and, and changed the world. Um, in the past few years, we've seen a dozen more space startups uh, come to Seattle. Um, some of you may have heard of, some of you may not have, but you will someday. Um, and uh, they, they've chosen Seattle as their home. Um, and in fact, the, uh, the new space conference uh, uh, came to Seattle for the first time this past June, had a, a record attendance. Uh, they've been in the Bay Area for, for many years, and I believe they've agreed now that every other year they're going to come to Seattle. Um, and so that is a really good thing for our industry. I think it's a, it's a good thing for you because um, you have an opportunity to, to be exposed and, and go in and see what's going on in this, in this small but very growing and exciting industry. Um, it's putting Puget Sound on the map as a hub for space entrepreneurship, and, um, and it's a, a place that's attracting talent and investment um, and collaboration. So uh, um, we've got some big plans for the future, and uh, some of those will be here in Kent, and some of those will be in our new site in Florida. Um, one of the big reasons we're flying New Shepard is so that we can practice. And um, as humans, we get great at things that we practice. Um, if you're going to get a surgery done, you don't go to the, the surgeon that does that surgery 12 times a year. You do it, you go to the surgeon that does it 12 times a day. You know, it's, it's, a, it's not, th this is just a, this is a fact. And so in the space launch industry, the best space launch companies are launching about 12 times a year. And so you're never going to get really good at that. So we had to find a market um, that would support practice, you know, increasing your operational tempo. And that's why we've uh, chosen to go with this suborbital um, flight. The New Shepard mission is our first approach. And we'll fly our space tourists, and we'll also fly space science payloads. We believe that'll generate, you know, hundreds or thousands of flights that will allow us to, to really ramp up that operational tempo and learn so we can apply that to our orbital launch vehicle. Um, so this image here is, a, is an image, an artist concept of our new orbital launch vehicle, which we're already starting to design now. Um, we will actually build it down in Florida, but we'll design it here in Washington. Um, and uh, powering this rocket will be a new engine that we call the BE-4. And the BE-4 is uh, designed completely in-house by Blue Origin. Uh, it generates uh, 550,000 pounds of thrust, and it uses um, liquefied natural gas as its fuel. Um, that is, uh, it's going to be a, um, a really, really powerful new engine and uh, a, a company that some of you may have heard of, the United Launch Alliance. Uh, it's a joint venture between Boeing and Lockheed Martin. They're America's premier launch company. Uh, they've chosen the BE-4 as the, as the engine to power their new Vulcan rocket, so we're really excited to be a part of that team. Um, the, uh, we're testing this engine down in West Texas. Here's an image of one of our recent testing uh, tests, and uh, soon we'll be selecting a location for full rate production of the engine, and we're looking at a, a wide range of states, including Washington. Um, we're working with uh, the Air Force, ULA, and Orbital ATK, and other launch company, and this investment that Jeff Bezos has put into Blue Origin has, has really made um, Blue Origin the kind of the engine supplier of choice. In addition to our launch vehicle aspirations, we've also be become a big supplier in that area as well. Um, at Blue, we take advantage of the fact that we're coming of age in this era of new advanced manufacturing technology and high-performance computing. Um, I mentioned additive manufacturing before. This is a really exciting area. Um, we have those 3D printers in our, our factory. We've got laser-wielding robots in our factory. Um, and we have a lot of folks that can, can harness that new technology to go develop new and exciting things. While we're really uh, very highly vertically integrated, we also rely on the supply chain. We're working with a lot of companies in the area and around the country to, uh, to, to uh, add speed and flexibility to our development. Um, our orbital, uh, our BE-4 engine takes this to a whole new level. And I want to show you a part. We call this the Gox Dome. This is the, uh, the, the part that is at the very top of the engine. All of the thrust loads go through this part. Uh, this part here was cast using traditional 100-year-old casting technology. It took one year to produce this first article. Uh, we deliver the design to the casting house. They deliver us a part. Uh, with additive manufacturing, we've also built this with additive manufacturing. That same part could be produced first article in three months. So um, that 4x increase um, in, uh, in part delivery allows a team to rapidly change. If, if you wait a year for this part and the design isn't quite right, you have to go back to the drawing board and start over. Um, with additive manufacturing, it allows you to really rapidly uh, develop 
uh, test and evolve your design and, and make it better. And that is a, a really important part of uh, additive manufacturing. It is truly magic, <laughs> uh, but it is something that's going to really, really disrupt uh, the manufacturing industry over the next few years. Um, that along with cloud-based computing um, uh, is it basically really helping us to evolve and, and accelerate our design timelines. Uh, we use cloud-based computing for computational fluid dynamics. We're studying combustion. We also use it for system optimization. We're trying to use our computers to get us into the ballpark of the of the best design so before we start to go off and design and cut metal. So these are things that just simply weren't possible back in the Apollo area. Um, at Blue, our motto is Gradatum Ferociter. That's step-by-step uh, -step ferociously. So uh, we, uh, much like Washington State, uh, we're always looking for an opportunity to improve and move forward. In addition to growth uh, at our site in Florida that I mentioned, we're, we're adding hundreds of new jobs here in Washington. We've added more than 200 uh, people this year to date. And um, we're already working with Washington State and the University of Washington to, to uh, do uh, research work and hire the best and brightest from our flagship universities. Um, and every summer we bring in collegiate interns. We're just nearing the end of our, well, right in the middle of our, our summer intern program. Um, and we also bring a few high school students in to, to have folks come in and, and help, us, uh, help us develop. Um, for many of us at Blue, we found our passion from things like uh, the moon landing that occurred 47 years ago. But for that next generation, we lean on people like Doug in the Museum of Flight. They have world-class education programs, um, uh, ACE Camp, Washington Aerospace Scholars, um, Amelia's Aero Club. Uh, these are, uh, and the Raceback Aviation High School, which is at the high school level. These are inspiring programs that, that uh, young people that are interested in aviation or space, they can really create that, that passion. Um, and in doing so, they're really helping uh, develop that next generation of, of industry pioneers. Uh, there's another uh, uh, thing that's happening here in Seattle coming up in October uh, uh, that the International Space University is, uh, is coming to town. And Erica Wagner here at Blue is very, very instrumental in bringing this in. This is a, um, a, uh, a university that's been around for a long time. Uh, they've chosen to teach a new course for non-space professionals here in Seattle in October. Uh, if you're interested, uh, there's going to be about 25 to 30 people. Um, there's, there's still openings. They just announced it last month at, at New Space, and it's an opportunity to learn more about this industry and how you, could, you, know, how you can learn the things you, you need to do to become a part of it. Um, if you're interested in learning more about Blue, I encourage you to sign up for updates on our website. If you do, you'll be among the first to figure out uh, when tickets are on sale and, uh, um, and how much they cost. Uh, we're not selling them yet, so uh, I'll answer that question now. And, uh, um, and then uh, we're, we're committed to building not just an awesome rocket, but an awesome team. And I want to show you a video that, uh, um, well, first I'll show you an image of me with a couple of our summer interns uh, out in Texas after our last flight just last month. Uh, and then I want to show you a video of what it's like to be at the Blue Origin factory on, on launch day. So if we can roll this video and then I'll wrap up. So. Estimate 30 seconds to engine start. Twenty-five thousand feet. <laughs> Track brakes are open. Thirteen thousand feet AGI. Estimate ten seconds to engine start. Engine start. We have thrust. Two thousand feet. One thousand feet. 500 feet, we are coming out. 150 feet, negative seven feet per second, gear deployed. 70 feet, 50 feet, velocity steady. Touchdown. That's a video that I can watch over and over again. And in fact, I have, and I've actually honed in on certain people, and you watch how they react. It's really kind of funny because knowing some of these folks that have been at Blue for 10 years, um, it's really was, was fun to watch how they reacted to that uh, and be a part of it. Um, 
Doug, when that vehicle made history in January, um, we, uh, we flew something for you and your team at the Museum of Flight. And it's an American flag, which I would like to present to you. Um, and we uh, oh hope you gosh, will display right. this proudly. It's been to space and back on the first uh, fully reusable rocket. And so, uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I'll just say thank you, Rob. Uh, no country has yet done what Blue Origin has done in landing back on the pad. Um, what an incredible thing. We, we will have this in our gallery that talks about the future. Um, the point being to help all of you understand the business opportunities, help you explain to your kids and grandkids the incredible opportunities they'll have in their life to change the world. Thank you for being such a leader and to Blue Origin. Great, thank you so much. I'm gonna invite Doug and Rob to stay here on the stage. We've got time for some questions. Sarah Weaver is on the mics and so is Alex Mummery. And it looks like Ken Grant has the first question. All right, I'm geeking out over here. I have a two part question if I may. Uh, one is to Rob, I guess they're both to Rob. First question is when. You, you, you mentioned when a lot and I have an eight-year-old and 11-year-old, and we talk about this a lot. When is when? Do you have even a guesstimate as to when is when? Because the three of us would like to do it. <laughs> when is, uh, so in 2017, we'll start flying our test astronauts, our Blue Origin employees that are being prepped for, for uh, flying on that. In 2018, we'll start to sell tickets and, and start flying commercially. Let so. me give you my card. <laughs> The other, you, the other question you bet. is back to the girls, right. 8 and 11. So how do we, are you doing anything or is the industry doing anything to entice these girls or guys now to be ready to be in that industry in 10, 15 years? For people to move into the industry? Yeah. Um, well, I think, you know, being here today, um, getting that message out, uh, educating the, the future, uh, the folks that we're, we're really trying to get people ready. There are, there are a lot of people that are, very, very um, motivated and passionate about the space space mission. Um, so, so we want to make sure we can lower the cost so that they can go execute on those business plans. Some of those business plans involve experiments. Uh, flying payloads uh, on New Shepard will inspire the next generation of, of students, uh, of engineers uh, and astronauts. Um, but, uh, but uh, yeah, we we want to keep keep doing that and providing opportunities. Let me speak to that for just a second. This, when there's another company in town here called Planetary Resources whose long-term goal is to mine asteroids. Um, and when they announced their company at the museum about two years ago, one of the reporters asked, they had eight people at the time, they said, are you hiring? And they said, no, but we'd like to hear from people who want to change the world. They got 2,000 resumes from 20 and 30-something engineers from around the world who want to be part of this. And the young people in, in our high school level programs, the, a lot of the people who come out of aviation high school will help make airplanes more efficient and design new wings and figure out new ways to, to go a little faster. But the thing that gets them excited, that lights their eyes up, is being a, a summer intern at Blue Origin and coming back and saying, I can't tell you what I did. I had to sign a non-disclosure agreement, but <laughs> I'm gonna go to space. And this is, Rob just said 2017. So this is, uh, this is the breakthrough, this is the tipping point. And so be talking to young people in, in, from the very youngest on up through high school, this is your opportunity, get ready for it. And to those 20 and 30 something engineers that are out there now or, or others in other kinds of businesses, you know, you're not gonna have to figure out how to get to space. He's gonna take you, what could you do when you're there? What are the apps? What are the things that your business, the medical research, the, the resource, the things we haven't thought of yet? So this is the moment when that change happens the way it did in computers in about 1970. Jeff has a question. Doug, Rob, thanks for being here. Um, a generation ago, Craig McCaw had an initiative called Teledesic, trying to get a low Earth orbit satellite network up into space, and that was before its time. But essentially, cellular uh, in low Earth orbit would be a great benefit. Uh, do you see that coming back anytime soon? I do, and, and um, yeah, and Teledesic was a little ahead of its time, and the terrestrial um, networks uh, really kind of uh, outpaced them at the time. 
But now that we have Pokemon Go and all kinds of other apps, <laughs> the, the need for bandwidth uh, has increased significantly. And so um, companies like OneWeb um, and, uh, and, and other companies that are working to increase space-based data um, uh, provide alternatives, really unique uh, ways to do that. There are companies out there that are starting to form and, and, uh, and, and get back into that market. So, and I'm excited about it because we want to launch them. So. <laughs> I'm sorry to say we've run out of time, but let's thank Rob and Doug. <laughs> wow, today we celebrate innovation, that awesome intersection of creativity, imagination, technology, and hard science. It reminds me of a TED Talk that was delivered by Steven Johnson a few years ago. Johnson was a popular science, is a, a popular science author and sort of a media theorist, but he was talking about where good ideas come from. And after listening to today, I've got to say they come right here in our neighborhood, and we are so fortunate. So again, our thanks to our uh, uh, speakers today for opening our eyes, and we need to continue to watch and look up because it's a, an exciting world up there. I want to offer two quick reminders here at the end of our program. Last week, I challenged everybody to consider a club read, Between the World and Me by ta Coates. Uh, hopefully you'll find a spare copy, uh, a new copy, a digital copy, but we have some club uh, past presidents who are gonna be leading some discussions uh, starting in August. So I encourage you to pick it up and read it so we can continue that important conversation on race. And I wanna just uh, tap into what Dorothy said during her invocation. It's been amazing to watch the news unfold just in the short week since we were together. And I personally have been shocked by the continued violence in our world here in the US as well as even last week in France. We as Rotarians are peacemakers. We are peace builders. And so if you are looking for a way to get started in doing that actively, or you're interested in joining others to, to do that, uh, in shared action. I'm gonna ask you to consider attending a Dialogue for Peace being sponsored by our Peace Builder Committee. <clears throat> It'll happen just before our meeting next Wednesday at the Westin. There are details at your table. There'll be details in the totem. Let's take action as Rotarians and champion peace and peace building in our world. <clears throat> We're headed off to space, but we wanna leave a peaceful world behind. I want to invite you to come back next week. We're going to be at the Westin for the Road to Rio, our Olympics program. Thank you, everyone, and we'll see you next week.